Welcome to another installment of Fighting for the Faith. My name is Chris Rosebro. I am your servant in Jesus Christ, and this is the channel that compares what people are saying in the name of God to the Word of God. So not just anybody is allowed or permitted to preach and teach in Christ's church. Notice I said it's his church. It's his. It ain't mine. And I would note that God has the right to determine who should or should not be preaching in Christ's church. That being the case, when a church openly disobeys what God has revealed in his word regarding who should be preaching and who should be teaching, that's a sure sign you need to leave. You don't stick around in places like that. You got to get out because God tells us to mark and avoid and to not listen to those who teach false doctrine. And when there are visible signs that the church that you may be attending or that a friend of yours is attending or a family member is attending, that they are flagrantly rebelling against God's command as to who should be preaching and teaching— that 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 you need to warn people, and so we'll, we're we're going to be looking at like visible signs of rebellion uh, in uh, in today's episode of Fighting for the Faith. We'll obviously be doing some biblical work, but what we're going to do is we're going to head over to Choose Life Church. That's where Charity Calstrip is teaching, but we're not going to be listening to Charity Calstrip who, by the way, should not be preaching or teaching at all. That is flat-out rebellion against God's Word, but we'll explain that. We're going to listen to the lady who runs the daycare at Choose Life Church preaching a sermon. <laughs> I mean, who's next? The, 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 the lady who cleans the bathrooms? I, you just one has to wonder. I mean, I, God has laid out it, it very clearly that there are those who are qualified and can teach in Christ's church and those who are disqualified. And I would note that just being a man doesn't qualify you. You There are other qualifications, and few men meet those qualifications. But uh, we'll talk about that along the way. So let's do this. Let's uh, whirl up the desktop. Again, that's uh, the Kongs of Ingor Lutheran Church in Oslo, Minnesota. That was a year ago, more than a year ago now. A big aurora borealis that was right overhead and here in North Dakota, Minnesota. That was amazing. But alas, that's, that's not what we're here to talk about. So we are going to be listening to Karina Carrasco. Karina Carrasco is the daycare lady, the lady who runs the daycare at Choose Life Church. And we're going to know there's rebellion all up, all up in here. <laughs> and she is clearly unqualified to be doing what she's doing. And and yet, uh, you know, the 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 head vision casting leader of Choose Life Church is in the audience listening to her spew complete and utter nonsense. So we'll, we'll talk about this along the way, but here's the setup for the sermon. We'll be talking about Jesus' transfiguration in a moment, but here's the setup. L listen in. Today, I'm going to be talking about personal contacts, which is also known as the lost. Um, and the title is Divine Power and Div Divine Influence. Note, Karina Carrasco is the head of Kids City Daycare at Choose Life Church. <laughs> I, I just have to ask you a question. If you went to see the doctor, right, you, you would expect that there would be standards for somebody to be a physician. And you got to the doctor because you know you were having abdominal pain, or maybe you know you had injured yourself and you needed medical care, and then Karina Carrasco came in. Karina Carrasco. And, uh, and she says, oh, I, I'm here to uh, examine you and, and uh, let's take a look at what's going wrong. Uh, tell me about your symptoms and stuff like this. And you got partway through the examination and you suspected that maybe, just maybe, Karina may not be the best doctor. And so you ask Karina this important question. Where did you go to medical school? And Karina says, oh, I'm the head of Kid City Daycare. And, uh, and the doctors here in this practice thought it would be really cool if, if, if I was able to operate in my gifting. They believe that I have a medical anointing. 
And so they they wanted me to operate in my gifting, and so they're giving me an opportunity to learn how to be a doctor on the job because they're just so cutting edge and and so forward thinking here. Would you stick around to have her treat you? Of course not, right? And so here's my question: If you wouldn't let Karina Carrasco treat you medically, why would you let her treat you spiritually? I ask the question because you'll note that the worst thing that could happen to you by a doctor is that through their negligence or inabilities or whatever, you end up dying physically. You know what? And that's the worst thing that could happen to you. But somebody who is practicing as a pastor, they're spiritual physicians. The worst thing that can happen to you is not that you physically die. The worst thing that can happen to you is that you end up in hell. And I would note, I would never entrust my soul to somebody who is not qualified to be a pastor in Christ's church. Not at, I I wouldn't darken the door of a church where there was straight up rebellion. Let's talk about this for a second here. Okay. So for instance, okay couple of passages. She's totally unqualified, like legitimately unqualified. Um, as in all the churches of the saints, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 14, starting at verse 33. As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches. They are not permitted to speak, but they should remain in submission, as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home. It is shameful for a woman to speak in church. But then watch what comes next. It's a conjunction. It's the word or, which means this is the continuation of the thought. Or was it from you that the word of God came? Or are you the only ones that it has reached? If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or thinks that he is spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. Who commanded that women should be in submission and not not preach and teach? Christ did. That's what Paul says. They need to acknowledge that what I'm writing you is a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. Anybody who will not recognize that this is a command of the Lord and they do this, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says that person should not be recognized. In other words, run away. Flee, mark and avoid. It's it's gangrene. It's a plague. It's a spiritually transmitted disease that's running through there, and it's flat out rebellion. But we continue. First Timothy chapter two also makes that point, starting at verse eleven. Let a woman learn quietly with all submiss- miss- submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Adam was formed first, then Eve. Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. That's pointing to the order of creation as well as who led humanity first into deception, right? So there's some reasoning as to why Christ has commanded that women are to remain silent in the churches. And then I would note qualifications for a pastor are these. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained in order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, husband, on air in Greek, of one wife, his children, his children, pronouns matter here, are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He, not she, must not be arrogant, quick-tempered, or a drunkard, or violent, or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He, again, pronouns matter, must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and to rebuke those who contradict it. And then I would note, talking about rebellion, there's an interesting text that I think is worth looking at in this regard. If we were to go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, everybody is trying to figure out, is the man of lawlessness about to come onto the scene? My answer is I have no idea. I don't care. If he shows up, he shows up. If he doesn't, I'm just going to keep on doing what I'm doing. If he shows up, I'm going to keep on doing what I'm doing until 
he decides to put me to death. That's kind of how this works. So concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the, the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Watch what comes next. Let no one deceive you in any way. Let no one deceive you in any way. Truth matters in Christ's kingdom. That day will not come unless the rebellion, apostasy, unless the rebellion comes first and then the man of lawlessness. I would note that when a church does this, that is an example of this rebellion. This church is in rebellion to Christ, rebellion to God. And according to God the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, if they don't recognize that it is Christ's command that women are not to have authority over men in the church and they are to remain silent in the church, then God commands that we are not to recognize them because they are engaging in this rebellion. That day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship. I would note that the church, the visible church, being an open rebellion against Christ is one of the things you're supposed to be looking for as we get closer and closer to the return of Jesus. This is that, rebellion. So just keeping this in mind, all right? So let me back this up just a little bit. As she's, she, This is the setup for her sermon. Here we which go. Which is also known as The Lost. Um, and the title is Divine Power and Duv- Divine Influence. Divine power and divine influence are two forces that we want to do the works in, that we want to walk in. But those things come upon us in our lives as we spend time with the Father. We don't ever want... So divine power and divine influence only come upon us as we spend time with the Father. Keep that in your mind because this is like the major thesis of her sermon. I don't do anything outside of having true relationship with the Father because when we have true relationship with the Father, that's where results are um, produced. Pr- uh, results that are going to bring him honor and bring him glory. That's by spending time with him. Yesterday. All right. So if you want, if you want divine influence and power, you have to spend time with the Father. Now I'm going to fast forward just a little bit where she then picks up on her thesis and tries to make a point from the Bible that makes it appear that her thesis is biblical. So in order for us to have divine influence and divine power, we have to spend time with the Father, she claims. Now listen to what she says here. But to to walk in that divine um, power, to walk in that divine influence, to have his divine life, you have to abide in the vine. That's You have to abide, abide in the vine, that's Jesus. Where power is going to come from. But like I was saying, Jesus spent time with the Father, and when he did, there was always something different about his countenance. So Jesus spent time with the Father, and every time he did, there was something different about his countenance. Can you give me examples, plural? I can't think of any. Like reading through the Gospels, like, oh, well, Jesus here spent time with the Father and everyone noticed his countenance was different. Hmm. So we got a problem here. She's theologizing. She's starting with her theology and now she's going to try to shoehorn a biblical text in to validate this theology that she's spewing here. Again, she's not qualified. She's completely unqualified to be doing what she's doing. So let me back this up just a smidge. Listen again. To have his divine life, you have to abide in the vine. That's where power is going to come from. But like I was saying, Jesus spent time with the Father. And when he did, there was always something different about his countenance. It says no biblical text. And we know that here in uh, Luke 9, 28 th- uh, through 36. In the Ampl- so here at Luke 9, 28 through 36 in the Amplified. This is an example of Jesus spending time with the Father and his countenance being changed. Watch this. I'm going to read it, but that's what happens when you spend time with him, not just your insides change, but your outside changes as well. You become. So when you spend time with the father, your insides change and your outsides change also. Okay. What does this have to do with Luke nine? Just like him. Jesus was different. Jesus was set apart, but so are we. Jesus was set apart, but 
so are we? I'm not God in human flesh. What are you talking about? Luke 9, 28 through 36, it says, Now about 80 days after these teachings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his countenance became altered, different, and his raiment became dazzling, white, flashing with the brilliance of lightning. His countenance was different, was different. So as we spend time with the Father, his glory will come upon us. His joy, it will radiate on our countenance, but that only... This is the account of the transfiguration of Christ. The text does not say that Jesus went and spent time with his Father and then his countenance was changed. Let's apply the three rules for sound biblical exegesis, which are context, context, and context. And that being the case, this is real simple. You'll note that the header for this section in the ESV is the transfiguration. And so now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. Nothing in the context here shows that Jesus spent quality time with the Father, which then resulted in his countenance changing, okay? He went up to, uh, on a mountain to pray. He brought Peter, James, and John. Two witnesses are the necessary witnesses to establish a fact, three more so, okay? And so as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with Jesus, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his, this is interesting in the Greek, his exodus, his exodus, his departure. It's interesting that in the Gospel of Luke, it legitimately says in his, uh, they spoke of his exodus. So Moses and Elijah showed up. And they were talking to Jesus about his exodus. How, was Je- how did Jesus' exodus occur? Well, first, Christ was crucified for our sins. He died. He was buried. And then it says, on the third day he rose again from the grave, and he ascended into heaven. Jesus' exodus is going to include his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. And that's what he was talking about with Moses and Elijah. This text is not somehow, well, you know, Jesus was set apart. You, you are set apart too. And, uh, and, and, and Jesus, his, his countenance changed, and yours will too if you spend time with the Father. No, not at all. Okay, so they were. This is a one-time event, and you don't get to repeat it because what's the reason why Jesus' appearance was altered? Because he's God in human flesh. He let whatever it was that was masking his divinity, he just let it go, and his divinity in the humanity came shining through. Right. So two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his exodus, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. His glory, that's the, that shows Jesus' divinity. And as the men were parting from, from Jesus, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's, it's good that we're here. Uh, let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, I would note, Moses is the representative of the Torah. Elijah, representative of the prophets. The law and the prophets testify of Christ, right? And here they are speaking to him. So Peter didn't know what he was saying. That's what the text says, not knowing what he said. As he was saying these things, a cloud came, overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. That's the whole point. Listen to him to Christ. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. Now let me show you what Peter does with this text, with the transfiguration. As Peter is getting ready to be crucified, he's at the end of his ministry, the end of his life. Peter writes this in 2 Peter, we did not follow 
cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He's referencing the, the Mount of Transfiguration. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, we ourselves, we heard this voice born from heaven, and we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you would do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now note here, watch how this works. This is my beloved Son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Peter has that same thing. We heard the voice and, you know, the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. And remember, listen to him is what the Father said. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention. Listen to Jesus is what Peter is saying. Where can I hear the voice of Christ in the Bible? That's what he's saying. So here, the lady, uh, Karina Carrasco, who's the head of Kid City Daycare there at Choose Life Church, she thinks that the transfiguration of Christ is an example of how his countenance changed because he spent time with the Father, and we too can have that same countenance change if we spend time with the Father. It's, just, it's proving that she, 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 she's unqualified, like triply so at this point. Listen again. That's what happens when you spend time with him. Not just your insides change, but your outside changes as well. You become So when you spend time with the Father, your insides change and your outsides change. Proof of this is the transfiguration of Christ. Really? I'm just like him. Jesus was dif different. Jesus was set apart, but so are we. In Luke 9, 28 through 36, it says, Now about 80 days after these teachings, Jesus took with him Peter and eight, eight days. John and James and went, went up on the mountain to pray. And, and as he was praying, the appearance of his countenance became altered, different, and his ra raiment became dazzling, white, flashing with the brilliance of lightning. His countenance was different. Was different. So as we spend time with the Father, his glory will come upon us. His joy, it will radiate on our countenance. But that only comes... The transfiguration is a one-time event pointing to the glory of Christ, because Jesus is God in human flesh, and the voice of the Father said, listen to him, and Peter makes it clear where we hear his voice, it's in the scripture. This is nothing to do with if you spend time with the Father, your countenance is going to change, just like Jesus's did on the Mount of Transfiguration. This woman is loony. She's utterly unqualified. Now, again, I ask the question, and it's real simple. Would you trust her to treat you for cancer? Why, if, if not, then why on earth would you allow her to treat your soul? Why? This church, Choose Life Church, Charity Calstrip, and all of the other pastors, including Karina Carrasco, the daycare lady, um, they are in rank rebellion against God. Rank. And you'll note, they, this was prophesied by the Apostle Paul as one of the signs that would be taking place within the church in the days immediately before the return of Christ. Do not participate in their rebellion by attending churches like this. That It's obvious that what they are doing is in rebellion against God and his word. That's what this is all about. Let's listen just a little bit. Comes when we spend time with the Father. Like I said, pe Jesus went out and he, um, people were drawn to him. He caught people's attention, not just by his countenance, but, but, but by the works he did. Why? Because there was power behind it. There was power behind it and there was power behind it because he spent time with the Father. So yes, anyone could go out and tell people about Jesus. Anyone could go out and, and share the word. But the difference is made when you spend time with Jesus because that's where power is going to attach itself to it. When you're in the Word and there's revelation and it becomes a part of you, it's not just words going forth. No, there's power going forth. The anointing is going forth. And we know... Oh, the anointing. Yeah, right. Yeah. She's also a false Christ as well. I think you get the point. This, 
this 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 church is in rank rebellion against Christ. Exactly what the Apostle Paul prophesied would be coming in the last days. So hopefully you found this helpful. If so, all the information on how you can share the video is down below in the description. And a quick shout out and a thank you to all of you who support Fighting for the Faith financially. You make it possible for us to do what we are doing here. And I want to say thank you. Many, many people have been positively uh, affected by the outreach of Fighting for the Faith, have had their eyes opened, have been delivered from false churches, and have found sound biblical churches that preach Christ and rightly handle the Word as a result of Fighting for the Faith. And by you making it possible for us to do this financially, you're partnering with us as we continue to do this work and warn people. So I want to thank you. If you would like to join our crew and those who support us financially, then there's a link down below in the description that will take you to our website so that you can join our crew and partner with us in the work that we are doing. And so until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won by Jesus Christ and his vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins. Amen. So nice to see that you've made it to the end. Before you inevitably click on another video to continue binging our glorious content, you should know about some of our other offerings. First off, some of you may know that our pirate captain is also the pastor of Kongsvinger Lutheran Church out in Oslo, Minnesota. The editor, that I totally don't have locked in my basement, produces audio and video versions of Kongsvinger sermons and Sunday schools weekly. So go check out kongsvingerchurch.org to see all of our offerings. Now, to address some of the frequently asked questions we get in the comments. <clears throat> what? The Bible and video editing software we use are named and linked in the description down below. Two, if you wish to donate to us directly so that we can keep the lights on, go check out www.piratechristian.com and hit the crew tab. We don't promise miraculous healings or a double increase in your finances, but what we do promise is more quality discernment from our studio into your ear holes. And three, how do you tie up with boxing gloves? Okay, who's the wiseacre who put this in here?